Hey guys, happy Monday. I know, not Wednesday, but today we will look at, I think I have eight questions as a review. Um, also, if you have review questions, if you're like, I don't understand this, I don't understand that, feel free to drop it in the comments box over here. Um, we today will work problems, try to answer as many questions as you have. Um, I can stay a little after 4.15 if we don't quite finish today. Um, so, but today we're mostly going to just work some problems. You may be feeling, as you think about exam three, you might be like, it doesn't, am I really going to need my calculator? We will use our calculators much, much less for this exam. Unlike exam one and two, where it was almost all math, nothing else, exam three is a lot more um, what's the best way to put this? It's like drawing, right? Like a lot of what we've done in this section is draw the structure. So you're going to draw the structure. So you should be prepared to draw all of those. Um, we, today I think they're kind of in order. We'll start in chapter seven and do a little bit from chapter eight and chapter nine as I'll actually, you know what? They're in some order. Some seven, some eight, some nine, who knows. Um, hopefully, if you guys have questions, I'll be able to answer them today. And let's see. That's, all, that's the other thing. The exam will run almost identically to exams one and two. It is open notes. You will need a periodic table. Um, I am, so some of you have reported that you're unable to see the periodic table. Um, I am working on that because we're going to need that as we move forward. So we'll figure out what all of that is going forward. It will be on Canvas. It will open in approximately 48 hours. The keys for all of the materials, like the worksheets, all of that's available. I Those went live yesterday, I think. Um, I feel like there's something else I was going to tell y'all. Well. I don't have anything. Does anyone, before we get started, have any questions, any topics where you're like, you know what, I really don't understand any part, any big questions. So what do you guys have today? Anything, nothing, everything? So far, nothing. Oh. So Jordan asks, will we be asked to use Slater's rules? No. Uh, Slater's rules is an important factor, but I will not ask you to use those rules. If I ask you, I will provide the rules on the exam. And you can just basically follow based on the... Um, you can read the calculation. So Nicole asks about hybridization orbitals. There are some questions on that. So Nicole, when you think, wait, Jordan, the short answer to your, to your question is no. We've got two upvotes, I like upvotes, for hybridization. So what about hybridization is the question? Now, I, I can talk about hybridization all day because I think it's super fun. But if you had to ask a question, is it, how do I know when when it is or not, right? Um, so either Nicole or Kajal, could either one of you, since you're both like, I wanna know more about this, can either or both of you give me some question about hybridization? Is it, how do you know what it is? Or let me know. So Billy Ann says, can you go over the different periodic table trends? We will talk about some of those. I don't remember if they're all in the list, but we'll try. And so Billy, Billy Ann's question corresponds pretty well with the first one. So the first question today is for the atomic size trend, so atomic radii, what is the trend across a row, so left to right, or down a period? So for number one, atomic size. When we think about the periodic table, 
which we could sketch here, as you go across, it turns out that the radius is going to get smaller. So it's going to get smaller due to an increase in Z effective. So Z effective is the nuclear charge, right? Or the effective nuclear charge. As we add electrons into this orbital, it basically is going to contract. It contracts because the nucleus becomes more positive as you add one proton every time. In that case, as it contracts, we're going to have to, it just is gonna get tighter and tighter and tighter. However, when we go down the row, it's going to get larger. And this is due to an increase in N. So basically, it gets larger. So think about each of these rows as a belt notch. As you, if, if you gain the quarantine 15 or any other weight at any point, your belt notch, it gets tighter, 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 and then you loosen it, and you can basically expand to fill that space. These are new notches, and as you go down, it is just bigger. As you go across, it gets smaller. So that's the first trend. So. Ooh, we've got a lot of questions about hybridization. So I'm going to... This is number one. This is the atomic size trend. I am going to take a break from the questions and talk about hybridization. So we've got a couple of statements about is it, I don't understand at all, totally valid. Is it, is it ever none? So hybridization, it is possible for there to be no hybridization. So let's think about this in terms of steric numbers. So these are our steric numbers. Now, steric number is a term that the book doesn't use and Alex doesn't use. I like it because it tells you steric number is basically science code for how many things are connected to the central atom. That's all it's asking. So if you have two things connected, Three things, four things, five things, six things. So steric number six is octahedral. The four is tetrahedral. And keep in mind when we think about steric number, it's not the number of atoms, it is the number of things. So whether it is, so for octahedral, if we have AX, If we have this, there are six things. Now, this could be two X's and four lone pairs or any combination of that. But the steric number essentially just means there are six things stuck around this. So hybridization in this class at UNF. So it's possible that if you took a different chemistry class at another university or in high school or something else, but not at UNF, then you've heard about dehybridization. So dehybridization mathematically doesn't really exist. So dehybridization is a way that we could try to explain the hybridization that we see here in steric numbers of five and six. By and large, for the purposes of my class, and I'm grading, so me, for steric numbers of five and six, there is no hybridization. So it turns out that there are a lot of really technical answers, which I'm not quite sure that that's what you're asking for. But for a steric number of five or six, there is no hybridization for the purposes of this class. So we know that those molecules exist. We know what those molecules look like. What we don't 
they do know. Like, if you're a chem major, you'll learn about this in other courses. But what we do know is that these structures are not really hybridized in the same way these are. So for steric number two, three, and four, we do see hybridization. The hybridization is always the same. For, well, for steric number two, three, or four. So this is trigonal planar, and this is linear. So for a steric number two or a linear molecule, this is going to be sp hybrid. So examples of that would be things um, we would see this for CO2, right? So CO2 is going to be SP hybridized. So we'll give ourselves an example, I'm trying to make sure I'm still on the board. So for trigonal planar, this will always be SP2 hybrid. So an example of this would be COH2. Mm -hmm. Tetrahedral is always going to be SP3 hybrid. And an example of that would be CH4. So when you think about a steric number of 2, 3, and 4, the hybridization for those atoms is always the same. So if there are three things connected to it, it is trigonal planar. We also know that it's going to be an SP hybrid. So for the steric number of four, it is SP3 hybrid. So Nicole asks, or makes this statement, if there's a steric number of one through four, there is always hybridization. In this class, yes. So if I ask, what is the hybridization of any molecule? You could look either at the Lewis dot structure or at the Vesper structure, because those two things should be synonymous, or give you the same info. When you do that, you can calculate the steric number, and from there, you can figure out what the hybridization is. Now, I think what makes it hard is you guys are trying to treat hybridization as a whole separate entity. I think my suggestion would be to think about this as anything that is tetrahedral, whether it is tetrahedral, trigonal, pyramidal, or bent, any of those three items are going to have an sp3 hybridization. Oh, I'm glad you guys are. Uh, Jordan, is it, an, is it sp for a steric number of one? It can be. But a steric number of one would be like a hydrogen hydrogen bond or a hydrogen chlorine bond, like a small molecule. So those are not always hybridized. I will not ask about two atoms connected together just via a single bond. Well, I won't ask about things like H2 because those are not hybridized. But if you think about the cyanide ion, which is CN, C triple bond N, that one is a hybridized, and so that is an SP hybridized. So let me re restate, Jordan. For a steric number of one, it is a safe bet for it to be an SP hybridized. Let's just go with that. I think that's a more accurate statement. Uh, triple bonds, so if you were to have a triple bond, So let's look at the carbon nitrogen, and in this case, we'll make it the anion. So let's just make it this. If you have this structure, so for carbon, so um, HCN in this case, we would consider the steric number here to be two, steric number two, and this would be a linear molecule with an SP hybrid. 
if you were to be, I'm going to step away from hybridization, but we're going to come right back. If you were to be asked how many sigma and how many pi bonds are in this molecule, because I've gotten a couple of emails for people to stop in office hours about this. If you were asked to count the sigma and pi bonds, so sigma and pi, for a sigma bond, every single bond is a sigma bond. One. So this is a triple bond. That means there are six electrons shared between. It turns out that the first, any one of these is a sigma bond. The other two are pi bonds. So we end up with two and two, where this is one sigma plus two pi, and this bond is one sigma. So it's kind of a trying to address multiple questions at once. But this, because it is steric number of two, would be linear. If you were to ask about the nitrogen, so the nitrogen also has a steric number of two, and it is linear, and it is also an sp hybrid orbital to create that carbon nitrogen bond. So I like it when you guys ask questions. I miss this part of the class. So as we think about both hybridization, sigma and pi bonds, what other questions do you guys have about, about what we're talking about? Is this helpful for hybridization? So I've seen a couple of people like, oh, now I get it. If you are still looking at me at your house, wherever you are, and you're like, you know, that was good, but I still have questions. Let me know what your questions are. Thoughts? Ooh, thanks for letting me know it's helpful. That makes me feel good. Thanks. Oh, good. Okay. So I have, does anyone have any, are there other topics I have missed in your questions? Mostly I saw hybridization. So are there other questions? I want this to be a review session for y'all. So if you have other questions, go ahead and drop it in the box, wherever the box is. If you're like, I would just rather you work these questions, I'm happy to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at number two. If you have another topic, or you could say like, uh, could we just skip ahead and do number five or number seven? or anything, if you guys, I want this to be helpful for y'all, so just let me know. So in this question, while you guys are thinking about that, it asks us to give the correct order or rank for atomic radius. So we're gonna use the trend that we talked about in question one. So we have calcium, potassium, arsenic, germanium, and krypton. I'm gonna go smallest to largest. So when we think about ranking, we wanna make sure that we look at the periodic table. Once you identify where all of these are, you'll notice that all of these are in the same row. So it's really easy. The ones furthest to the left, the right, sorry, all the way, so the noble gases are the smallest. Okay, so for number two, we end up with krypton is smaller than arsenic, smaller than germanium, which is smaller than calcium, which is smaller than potassium. So in this case, it is asking, if it asked you to do this, you could have also given them in commas, provided your answer goes in the right direction. So keep in mind, Canvas is still a computer. And so it may be like, ooh, you didn't set it up correctly. But if it asks you to rank them from smallest to largest, you could have also subbed out the um, greater than, less than signs for commas. 
So while you guys are thinking, also, if you have any questions about this material, let me know. So for number three, yeah, we'll leave where it is. It asks us to write the equation for the third ionization of aluminum. So the third ionization is the equation that corresponds to I3. Now, there are two ways that you could think about this. You could start with number one, write out the first one, the second one, the third one. The other thing to remember is whatever this subscript is tells you what the superscript is on the product. So for aluminum, it'll be the aluminum 2 plus to the aluminum 3 plus plus 1 E minus. You could also write it as Al 3 plus plus E minus. If you want it to be technical, although I'm not asking you to be, all of these are in fact in the gaseous state. So, so far, what questions do we have about any of this material? Or are we like, mm, can we get on to the more exciting stuff out of chapters eight and nine? So number four asks, which element of the selected element has the most negative electron affinity? Now, electron affinity is a little weird because the more negative the number, the stronger the electron affinity is, right? So the electron affinity trend is different than the, what do we talk about, atomic size. So... For electron affinity, if we have a periodic table, the trend is that we see a large increase as we go across, and we see a small increase as we go down. So when we think about these questions, so we want to identify where all of these are, and we're looking for the element that is furthest to the right and furthest down. That will be the highest electron affinity. So when you look at these, and you identify where they are on the periodic table, so periodic trends are impossible to add, to like answer without the periodic table. So in this case, sulfur is going to have the largest electron affinity or the most negative electron affinity. So keep in mind, I will try to word them in this way to where you're not like, if I ask which one is the largest, I, it, it just gets a little murky. Let's leave it at that. So Zara asks, why does aluminum have a two plus? So she's, they are asking about the previous question about the ionization, the I3 for aluminum. So ionization energy is the ability to remove one electron at a time. So in this case, the I3 is the ability to remove the third electron. So that means I1 is aluminum goes to Al plus plus E minus, I2 takes aluminum plus to Al2 plus plus E minus. So the equation for aluminum three is the Al2 plus goes to aluminum three plus plus one E minus. So in ionization energies, it's important to remember that it's not necessarily the ability to get So in this case, it's not necessarily related to what the preferred charges are or are not. The ionization energy is the ability to rip off any electron, one electron at a time. Does that answer your question? So Jordan asks, why does it increase going down? So 
good question. So to be quite honest, the trend for electron affinity is super murky, mostly because you can't correspond to any of these, and there are a lot of places where it's zero. So I'll send you an email, Jordan, because to be honest, I cannot remember why it goes, it increases. But it is a substantially tiny increase. So to answer this question, um, I looked at the table. And so the difference between oxygen and sulfur was like pretty close. So keep in mind that electron affinity is different than electronegativity. They sound the same, but they are different and those trends are different. So I will look that up and send you an email about it with a more exacting response, unless it comes to me and then we'll circle back. Any other questions about any of the periodic trends as we've talked about them? Jordan, Jordan asks, isn't electron affinity related to electronegativity? They are related, but electronegativity also includes ionization energy. And the way I think about electron affinity is their desire to add an electron or more than one electron. So we know that some elements prefer to add electrons. Electronegativity tells us about how badly they want to hoard electrons. So electron affinity is part of electronegativity, but at, so is atomic size, ionization energy, and Z effective. So basically, electronegativity is all of the periodic trends that we talked about put together and looked at together. So they do not all follow the same trends because electro, the trend for electronegativity is different than the electron affinity trend that we're looking at here. Good questions though. Other questions? So, for the next 20 minutes, we are going to try to draw as many of these as possible. We're going to cap it at 20 minutes. Here's why. There are some other topics that we will see. You should expect for questions that are identical to this on the exam. So, the best way to do this is to approach each one and follow the rules. There is a PDF document that basically has all the rules in a row. It talks about how do you make a Lewis dot structure? What do we do with the Lewis dot structure? How do we make a Vesper structure? You can't really make Vesper without Lewis dot. In this case, with the exception of D, which I would have provided more connectivity information for you, um, you can assume that the first one is underlined, I will double check, but I tend to try to do that. That must have just gotten, you know, I'm not sure you can underline in this program. So that's how we do this. So we'll work through as many of these as possible in 20 minutes. Whatever we don't get to in 20 minutes, I will do at the end. But I want to make sure that we get through there, get through as many as possible. So for A, We have SEF6. So the first thing we want to do is calculate the valence electrons. 
which is 6 plus 6 times 7, which gives us 48. We're going to put selenium in the center and connect our fluorines to it. Now we're going to add our 9 million lone pairs. which does in fact take what feels like 300 days to do this, but they are important. So from here we have used, it turns out, 48 of our electrons. So there are 48 electrons, we've used them all. Selenium, because it is in the n equals four row, has access to d orbitals, so it can have an expanded octet. The most expanded it could be is in fact 12 electrons around it, which is what we have here. So in this case, we have an octahedral structure. How did I figure that out? There are six items connected to it. So we'll put our selenium in the center. So then we're going to put all of our fluorines around it. And again, we will add our lone pairs. If you would like full credit, your structures must have wedges, dashes, bond angles, and lone pairs. So there are some people who do not draw lone pairs on Vesper structures. We will be drawing lone pairs on every atom every time. We can feel free to pop an office hours tomorrow or later this week or at another time if you want to talk about that. Mm. So Sarah has some pro tips for you guys. She is looking at the weekly assignments. Um, yeah, my guess is you guys aren't showing your exterior lone pairs. You have to show all of your lone pairs. So the question also asks to name the electron and the molecular geometry. In this case, they are both octahedral. What questions do we have about A? Do we have any questions about A? While you guys think about that, I will start on B. So B is GEH4. Our valence electrons are four plus four times one, which just gives us eight. So our structure is substantially easier to draw. So from here, we have our four angles. We can count, there's one, two, three, four things connected to it. That gives us a steric number of four. So our GE goes in the center. And we can draw all of our hydrogens here. The electron geometry here is tetrahedral. And our molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. So Avery asked, do we need to include the bond angle? Double checking the question. I, if I ask for it, please include it. If I don't, you are more than welcome to include it. Um, I try to be as specific as possible. So I know that there are questions where it will say, draw this structure, label all the bond angles. In that case, most definitely you need the bond angles. In this case, because this question doesn't ask for that, you're not required to include that information. So I don't try not to include information that I didn't ask for. But if you have decided that that's how you think, then please do that. So I do want to talk about one thing. I've seen a couple of people do this, where for GE, you will just draw it something that looks a little bit like this. We'll draw it up here.
where you basically took your Lewis dot structure, swapped out one line for a wedge and one line for a dash, and it looks the same. This will not get you very many points at all because the important part is the ability to draw this structure. So this structure tells us something about what it looks like in 3D. This structure doesn't actually tell us anything about the bond angles. So make sure that you are drawing them with a bond angle. Now, you don't need a protractor. Sometimes mine are like super close to 109. Sometimes they're a little bit more. This one looks like a little bit more. I'm just asking for some definition. If, there are a, if one of them is 90, you're not gonna get marked off. But if all of your bonds look like this, this is not in fact a Vesper structure. This is just a, a mess. So make sure that you are drawing things that look somewhat like this. Questions about A or B, if there are none, I will go ahead and work on C. is ASF3. Our valence electrons in this case are 5 plus 3 times 7, which gives us 26. So we'll put our arsenic molecule in the center, put three fluorines on it, we have an additional set of lone pair or uh, there are two leftover electrons once you finish this. Those two end up here on our central atom. So you should always double check. We've used 28, 16, 24, 26. So from here, we have a central atom. That central atom has four things connected to it. It is tetrahedral. So we can draw our arsenic in the center. And now we have basically the same base structure as we have over here but slightly different. So we will have three fluorines and a single lone pair. You could put any of those anywhere you want. I tend to put my lone pairs at the top for no real explicit reason. You could put it anywhere you want. Say you put your lone pair here, as I am, then you're gonna add your fluorines and all of their lone pairs. I moved that in a little to give us some space. So now we have this. The electron geometry is tetrahedral. Your molecular geometry in this case is trigonal pyramid. Because, so the electron geometry tells you this. Here's what the organization of items around our central atom. That's what it tells us. The molecular geometry tells us what does it look like without lone pairs. So, if we have this structure again, so we have these three items at the bottom. This lone pair is missing. So all we can see is this moderately shaped trigonal pyramid because the electrons cannot typically be viewed spectroscopically. Basically, we have super fancy cameras that take pictures of molecules. Those super fancy pictures do not include electrons. However, there is a new set of cameras that are showing electrons, but the olden days, we could just see atoms, no lone pairs. So what it is, is just that this here looks like a pyramid with a lone pair on top. Questions so far. Do we feel like drawing structures is like super easy or are we like, no, I don't know. How do we feel about this? I will erase the board and look at D.
So for D, I would not just give you the molecular formula and be like, have a good time. That's, that's crazy. For a single central atom with some exteriors, I'll give you that and like let you go. Ordinarily for this, this one, I will give you a little bit more information so that you're not like just sticking stuff together. So in this case, if our Lewis dot structure is as follows. So we have a Lewis dot structure. Now, we technically have two central atoms. In the videos, I talk a lot about like drawing a square around those in the middle and trying to make sure those are in the plane of the paper. So when we think about the carbon, the steric number for carbon is four. You could just cover up the rest of the molecule and be like, oh, there's only four things. It doesn't matter that this piece over here has got some more fringes going on. So now we're gonna start with our carbon. So I'm going to put my nitrogen here. You could put it anywhere you'd like. Our nitrogen also has a steric number of four. So now we just need to put our lone pairs and our hydrogens on. The hydrogens all go here. On the nitrogen, you can put the hydrogens and the lone pairs anywhere you want on these structures. Now, why do I like to put my lone pairs in the plane of the board? I don't have a good answer for that. It's just something, it's a habit I've adopted. To be honest, some of it is that I have a hard time visualizing the lone pairs if they're at the end of the dashed lines because they just kind of escape into space. But that's me. So what questions do we have about this? Let's, oh, I forgot our, we have for carbon, the electron is tetrahedral. The molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. For nitrogen, the, oops, the electron is tetrahedral. And the molecular is trigonal pyramid. If I were to ask you, well, let's do it this way. In the comment box, tell me what the hybridization for nitrogen is. So you can just drop that in the comment box. I know it's not part of the question, but think about it. Using the information of what we know about hybridization, what is the hybridization of nitrogen? Ooh, I was kind of afraid that if I asked. Oh, good. We've got some SP. We have an SP3. We have a taker for that. We've got a couple. That is 100% correct. It is sp3. So it is sp3 because it has four things connected to it. Good job, guys. This is fun. We'll have to do this more often. So when we think about hybridization, we can only do that right for steric numbers four or less and they're always going to be the same. So basically, if it is an electron of tetrahedral, it's always going to be sp3. There are no exceptions to that. Well, there, there might be. In this class, there are no exceptions at all. So let's look at E and F. We're making good time today. So E is IF3. Valence electrons here are 7 plus 3 times 7, which gives us 28. We'll put our iodine here in the center. 
add our three fluorines, start using all of our lone pairs on the exterior atoms. Once we do this, we've used 24 of our 28 electrons. That means there are two pairs of lone pairs. There are two pairs of electrons. There we go. So we'll put one here and one here. So once we do this, we can say there are one, two, three, four, five items connected to it. So we have iodine. We're going to run out of space, so we're going to scooch over a little bit. We know that a steric number of five gives us this structure. A steric number of five is always going to give us an electron geometry of trigonal five pyramid. So from here, we now are going to add in our atoms. Based on the table that I provided, when we lose two atoms to become lone pairs, they go along here to where we end up with a molecular geometry of T-shaped. So the electrons want to be as far apart as possible as well as the atoms. So in this case, the bond angle here is gonna be a little bit less than 90, and this will be a little bit greater than 120. So in this case, we have the trigonal bipyramid and T-shaped. Don't forget, we can see T-shaped, it looks just like a lot like this, but you can see it for the octahedral base. Questions, thoughts, comments? So for F, we have gallium trichloride. So in this case, we have three valence electrons plus three times seven gives us 24. We'll plop our gallium in the center, add our three chlorines. So from here, we've used up all of our valence electrons. So we've used up all of those. So we have a steric number of three. So that gives us gallium with our three chlorines. to where we, our electron geometry is trigonal planar and our molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. I saw some questions. So Jordan asks, why would the bond angle be less than 90 degrees? So it turns out that in that case, it depends on what you're measuring. It is slightly less on both of these. So if you're measuring my feet, which you cannot see, or a fluorine, my head will be the iodine. These are the other two fluorines. So we're measuring the bonds that have basically done this. And they have collapsed this way just a little in order because the lone pairs basically push out. And when they do that, it basically pushes these down just a little. We're not talking about a massive deviation from 90, but that is the angle that we're looking at. But I will tell you that it does feel like, how could it be anything other than 90? But it is because this, the F, I, F, what we would consider the linear bond, is no longer linear. It's kind of a little like squashed. So Billy Ann asks, since the angles are different, would we have to know that? Um, you would have to note that 
in the event that I asked. I'm mostly just trying to give you guys a little bit more info as we move along. So keep in mind, you only need to, if I ask, draw IF3, what are the bonding laws? But all of that information you can find, there's a table in, I think it's, there's a VSPER table module. There is a table in there that has all of these structures and the bond angles and the names, and you can go looking for that. If you can't find it, send me an email. I will send you more direct information. What other questions do we have about drawing these type of structures? If you think it's easy, pretty simple, let me know in the chat. If you're still like, oh man, if you're struggling, I think one of the things you need to do is to draw more. So I talked about last week, you probably want to have drawn almost a hundred structures. A hundred's like way overkill, TBH. But the goal here is the more that you practice, the faster it will be when you get to that question. So let's, let's look at number, sweet, number six. So this is a bond enthalpy question. I realized later that it has a typo, so it asks you to solve for delta H not F, but we're just calculating delta H reaction. So when we think about this question, so, this question says, using the following bond enthalpies in this table, calculate delta H, this should say reaction, for H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. So we have an equation where H2 plus O2 goes to H2O2. Now, I also give you the connectivity for H2O2 because hydrogen peroxide is like a weird molecule. That's why. So we know that we're going to have... H2 plus O2 goes to H2O2. So when we look at this, the valence electrons are two. So we'll all get this structure. For oxygen, we end up with this Lewis dot structure. So the Lewis dot structures are going to be important, right? Because it's bonds broken minus bonds formed. So we need to know what bonds we got going on. So we have the valence electrons here, which will be 2 times 1 plus 2 times 6, which equals 14. So we know that they're going to be connected like this. So we have octet here and here. There are 2, 4, 6, 6 used, so we have 8 left. Those 8 electrons will go around our oxygens. So this is the structure for peroxide for hydrogen peroxide, where we have H, O, O, H, all single bonds, lone pairs. So now that we have structures, we can calculate bonds broken minus bonds formed. So our broken would be H, H, which based on the table is 436. We have an O, O double bond which is 495. When you add those up, you get 931. This is broken minus formed, so now we're going to have two OH bonds, and those come in at 463 kilojoules a pop. And we have a single OO bond, which comes in at 146 kilojoules. So when you plug that in, you get 1,072. So when you subtract these, delta H reaction is negative 141 kilojoules. So when we think about... All right, I'm just going to stand in the way. So when we think about this question or this type of question, what types of questions, what questions do we have about this? 
I will tell you, if this is on the exam, you will be asked to draw the products and the reactants into this calculation so that you can kind of try to think about what they are. So you'll need both of those. Angela asks, and which probably is happening at the same time due to the lag, um, you will definitely need to draw both of these structures. Otherwise, it's impossible for you to set this calculation up all by yourself. Good question. Other questions that you guys might have about this material? We're doing pretty good on time. Well, that's not helpful. So, our next calculation uses our calculator. Well, I guess you would have needed your calculator to do this math. So, that's great news. So, in this question, it says, in teeny tiny font, a molecule contains a PF bond, which is quite polar, or it is polar. If the bond length is 1.54 and the F atom has a partial charge of 0.245 electrons, it asks us to calculate the dipole moment and draw the dipole. So we'll do part A and then we'll do part B. To calculate the dipole, I need a new marker. This one's not, not cutting it. So a dipole moment is calculated using the equation mu, which is the dipole, equals Q times R. Q is the charge, R is the radius. Both of these numbers come in the problems. So we can start to plug those in. So if Q, which is our charge, is 0 0.245 electrons, we know that our bond angle is 1.54 angstroms. When we plug these in, we're going to get a number if you multiply these two things. The problem is electron angstroms is not, in fact, a bi. So we need to convert electrons and angstroms into coulomb meters in order to use the conversion factor. So we know that one angstrom is 1 times 10 to the negative 10 angstrom uh, meters. Sorry. One electron has a charge of 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So now we've canceled out these units. And we have Coulomb meters, and so the conversion is 3.34 times 10 to the negative 30th Coulomb meters in one Dubai. So when we plug this into our calculator and we get an answer, mu equals 1.8097 Dubai which when we use our sig figs, it gives us 1.81 Goodbye. Questions? Thoughts? Terrified? So this question is a series of unit conversions. It's just like what we learned in chapter one, right? In chapter one, we looked at all of the different ways we can take any given unit. So angstroms is a variety of length. The Dubai conversion will be on an equation sheet or should be in your notes, as well as the charge on an electron. So Jordan got negative 1.81. So you likely included the negative charge here. And so the negative charge uh, or the charge on this is the absolute value of the charge. So. Right, so in this case, based on our 
dipole moment, which looks like this. This is telling you the partial charge here is a partial negative of 0.245 electrons. So if I had given you the charge on the other one, it would have been positive. You just needed to use the absolute value in that case. Good question. So this would be the drawing of the dipole moment, right? The arrowhead points to the more electronegative atom. So the delta minus would be on the electron on the element with the arrowhead pointed towards it. Good questions. Also, did that answer your question, Jordan? I realized that I moved on and wasn't really paying attention. So any other questions about this calculation? Any other thoughts? I don't want to say concerns. In just a second, we are going to draw the big molecule, the glutamic acid that was at the end of last week's live session that we didn't get to. So, make that go away. So, in this case, this question says, glutamic acid is one of the amino acids. Based on the Lewis dot structure, which I will provide, if I ask you to do something of this size, I will ask you, I will give you a Lewis dot structure. It also asks for each central atom, determine the electron domains, the molecular geometry, and the hybridization, count the sigma and pi bonds. So, what do we do now? Well, that's a lie. First we panic, then we make a plan, right? So when we look at this structure, even without the Vesper structure, you could, on your Lewis dot structure, determine all of the hybridizations. It's a big factor, right? You could look at that because the steric numbers are provided in the Lewis dot structure. So the hybridization, you got that. You could also count the sigma and pi bonds, which we'll get to. So, to make you guys feel better, I tried to draw this a couple of different times before it worked. We're not asking for something totally perfect. So as we think about drawing this molecule, one, it's very big. It would be my recommendation that you start this problem on a new sheet of paper. Don't try to do it off in the corner. Just make it its own page on the exam so that you can have as much space as possible. Now, you also want to start on one side and move to the other side. Don't try to spend forever trying to make it perfect. At some point, it will look a little silly, and that's okay. So I'm going to start with the nitrogen. We know that based on the steric number, we know that the nitrogen, oh, I'm stuck behind it. The, well, the only nitrogen we have, that nitrogen has a steric number of four. So we're going to draw it a little differently. So now we're going to put our hydrogen's lone pair in the carbon. We put a hydrogen here, put a lone pair here, put a hydrogen here. Now we have our carbon. So we've basically just moved one over. That also has a steric number of four. So now we have a hydrogen, another carbon, and another carbon. So I'm going to Put my other carbon here. We have a carbon here, we have a hydrogen here, we have a carbon here. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because this second carbon, this C double bond O, here, 
That one has bond angles of 120 degrees. But we already have one going back into the board. Just bear with me. Don't pay me. So once we do this, we know that the bond angles need to be 120 degrees. So we're going to end up in a structure where we're going to have one in the plane of the board and one wedge. And that wedge would go. So we're going to have a wedge and a dash. Here we're going to add the other oxygen, and the oxygen here with our lone pairs. So on this oxygen, we are going to have You'll notice it's getting a little murky. The further along this molecule goes, the harder it gets. That's okay. So from here, we will go up here. We have wedges and dashes with our two hydrogens. So we have a carbon here. This, I wish I had done a little bit further down, but we're gonna roll with that. We have an oxygen here. And based on space, it should look something like this. Now, oh, Nicole asks, how would you like us to organize and label a structure like this so you know which labels go with which central atoms? Oh, by all means, if you want to color code it and you and I can follow that, knock yourself out. Um, I am going to move this down here so that we can actually see what I drew. The other thing that I would do if it was me is I would draw arrows. This is also significantly bigger than what I would ask you on the exam. Like, this is a very large molecule. Don't feel... Don't panic about this. So you could also do squares, circles, circles, squares. You can make up any code that you want. Also, it's possible that I wouldn't ask for every last one just because that's kind of a lot. So Before I run all this up here, um, there's only a couple of minutes left. So what questions do you guys have today before I let you go about exam three, about the information, about the material? I'm going to try to label all of these so that you guys can get the electron and the molecular geometries on all of them. But it's just going to take me a while. So I'm going to work on that. If you have a question, feel free to drop it right here in this comment box. And I will answer those. I can hear it. It makes a noise when you do that. So I'll be able to do that. Here we have an electron of tetrahedral. Molecular is bent. I think it asks for hybridization, sp3. This one, the electron and the molecular are both trigonal planar. SP2. Electron tetrahedral. Molecular, also tetrahedral. And these are SP3. Electron tetra. The molecular is trigonal. Pyramid. The hybridization is sp3. This carbon and this carbon are tetrahedral. Tetrahedral sp3. 
it turns out that this oxygen is the same as this one and this. Whoops, trying not go in any bonds. The electron and the molecular geometry are trigonal planar sp2. So, oh wow, that's like a hot mass express. Oh, the sigma and pi bonds. Thank you. I totally forgot about that. So, in this case, the number of pi bonds is probably the easiest. We know that there is a pi here in this bond as well as this. So, there are, where can I draw this? Sigma, pi. There are two pi bonds. Now we count our sigma bonds. So, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Is that what, Catherine, did you count the sigma and pi bonds? Is that what you got? I get 18 and two pi's. Thank you for reminding me that that was part of this question. What other questions do you guys have as we think about the material that you guys will ex not encounter, but that will be on the exam? Do you have any other questions? Any other things that you'd like me to review? Tomorrow from 1030 to noon, I will be in Zoom. So you can access that from the homepage for our Canvas course. There's a, like it says Zoom. You can basically click that link and go to that. Um, there is SI both tomorrow and Wednesday with Megan. She will answer and work more problems with you guys. Um, okay, so How do I make that? So it turns out that I have no idea how to show you the affinity trend. But for electron affinity, so the trend is a mess, apparently. So we increase as you go this way, and that we all agree upon. Oh, God, I've done this under this picture. So for electron affinity, so I happen to be looking at it earlier. So I think the fairest thing to think about is the fact that it increases across. It turns out that it doesn't actually follow a trend up and down. Um, so I... Ah, uh, let's see if I can add in this image. Nope. Yes. Well, like, not on my face. Thanks for that. Um, so if these are the, whatever, over here. So this is the electron affinity trend. And so what we can see as we look at these numbers is that the trend is murky at best. So um, I think you are, no, I don't think. You are correct in the fact that it does increase across, and by and large, it increases from bottom to top. However, oxygen must be, oxygen must not follow the trend.
likely I will not ask a question in the same way because I um, I will relook at this. You can trust the video that I talked about in the um, periodic trends. That one is correct. Uh, the periodic trend is increases across and will go with increasing bottom to top or a slight decrease as you go down. But even that doesn't seem to be right. Um, so we... I will not ask questions that require something more than just a generalization of the trend. So sorry about that. Um, any other questions about anything else that we've talked about? If not, I will see you guys next We'll see you guys in a while. Um, I will, we will not meet again. We're not meeting next week. I will see you the week after the last week of classes on Wednesday. Good luck on your exam. If you have questions, please, please, please come to office hours. Hope you guys have a good one.